Now I'm trying to finish all the shaping on this mold. We didn't finish this on the last tape. I'm just trying to take that little undercut out. And I want to, I hope before the day's over, I can get one piece molded up here anyway. Get this in a mold. Okay, now the rest I'll do with the sander, of course. Get this, get this nice smooth shape back and then make sure I haven't made it too much undersized. It was these corners that are the main thing. Okay, you can see in the front here, I've got the contour blended in for this step, and I've got the same amount. I want to try the first piece in 3.30 seconds, so I've got just a little bit extra, and I'll have just enough to blend in there. And the way I, well, the way I try to scope this out is to look down the whole length of the fuselage and make sure I have an equal amount, so that molded piece is going to go right on there. Okay, so the next thing is I have to mount this onto a base plate. i got to go over to my hardwood, the, the wood that normally you order from whoever, and it comes in 12 pound wood, this is a good place to use it up. Well, what I'm going to do is, I'm cutting a corner of this back, just so I have a place that I can seat the wire. And I went to the wood over there and found out I really don't have a, a long enough piece. I'm going to have to join two pieces, but it won't really make any difference. All this is going to be is a place to seat the wire. That'll be for our separation line. Cutting that edge in there will just give me a little place, just that wire can sit right in there. It doesn't have to be exactly no, just, just press it down now so we use the table. I'm just going to tack it. Oh, this is... Camera, we curse out John DeTavio for not buying fresh CA. Just let it go right down the whole edge because that's where the wire is going to go. Keep pressing. Okay. So just let it kick automatically now. It'll let it kick. It's nice and flat on the table. We're trying to get George's giving me a hand holding this all down on the table because I don't want to make a banana one way or the other. Piece over there. We get the joint. We're going to band saw this right off anyway. John, buy new glue. This isn't the freshest tube of glue. It was fresh, I guess, till a week ago. <laughs> he got this on sale somewhere. Now, despite the John not coughing up for some fresh glue, okay, we're mounted to the base plate. We're going to go to the Dremel, the little Dremel saw, and saw off all the excess.
Now we have to mount this and sand in the edge even. What I did right on that groove, and that's why I countersink that groove just a little bit. You can see the idea here is that I've embedded in a piece of that, any, any wire actually, 32nd inch wire. This is probably a 16th wire, but it really doesn't matter. Whatever wire you happen to have. Now what that wire does, it sticks up above the wood just a little bit. And when we wrap this with ammoniaized sheeting, what's going to happen is that wire is going to leave its little impression right down the edge. And it's going to give us a line, a reference line, that we can cut the mold. Without that, if you were to just work off of this piece, when you wrap the edge piece around, it wouldn't have any place to go. And you would wind up with some, I've tried doing that, and it's really, you'd have to cut the sheeting almost to exact size to begin with. So, to me, the whole thing that made these molds practical on a Spitfire and on John DeTavio's Cardinal and on several other planes, I think I did a couple for Lee Self and a couple other people that use molded parts for Cardinals, the thing that makes it possible is that wire. That's, that's the key to having this, that it's easy and doable for the average guy. Now, I always write on the back of what it is, the back of the mold, what, what I'm doing. There's a simple reason, because all these molds start to look alike after some point in time. And if you don't, you might be using the top to the bottom, the bottom to the top. But the final check is before we actually mold up a piece of wood here, grab one of the fuses, make sure when we lay it on there that we have that same amount of gap. And when that molded piece, I'll trim the front, and we'll be ready to do, once we get some molded shells, we'll be ready to do cowling blocks. It should be very nice. Okay, these are just some of the molds in inventory, and you can see, and I'm only doing this for my own reference, Spitfire nose section. I have a hook, and I'm going to take, I'm going to steal one off of one of these because I need a hook to hang this. What I do is when I ammoniaize the wood, I wrap it with an ace bandage, and I hang it up in the shop by the tank, by the tank vent, by, by the heating vent, by the tank vent, that's a good one. Anyway, turtle deck to the Spitfire, basically the same technology. Sea fire. So the reason I say this is now these two all start to look alike. You'd hate to mold up a good piece of wood and all of a sudden what the hell is, oh shit, I used the wrong mold. So if you mark each one, you put this little hook in the front of each one, it's real handy and you always can take it out and put it onto the next one. Now I know the most tempting thing everybody would have to do is go over to your wood pile, which I've just done, and go weigh all the pieces of wood, which we've already done, and pick the lightest piece. Well, when you're doing a mold, it isn't real important to have a light piece of wood. It's important to have the grain go right down the center of the wood. Because the wood, you're never going to be able to carve something as thin as you can mold it. Now looking at this, this is B grain, not so good. Will not make a good mold. That one's B grain. No good. These are all too stiff. The grain in them is too stiff. I'm looking for a piece of A, this is a C grain, so forget that. That's a fuse side. C grain. It takes a little fooling around to find a piece that's going to be, boy, there's some nice fuse sides in here. I didn't realize they were in here. Okay, so it looks like within my pile of wood, I only have two pieces to pick from. This one looks the best. And I, I actually, this one is the best. I have two. I'm going to have to make two. So this is as close to being an A-grain piece of wood. A lot of times you can side it up against the light. You'd like to have the grain going right down the middle, if possible. Not to pay too much attention to trying to make it the lightest piece of wood. <clears throat> what I found out from doing the Spitfire, I molded many pieces of the super light wood, and when I was all done trimming and sanding and carved, it was no lighter than when I used a piece with the grain right down the middle. Really like about a six pound piece of wood with the grain going right down the middle is the best. You can get most of the sanding done right on a mold that way. Now the acid test is always, I don't know if I mentioned this before, that you can, you can have a little bit of flexibility here without the wood splitting. Another thing too is I've made shells out of 3 32nd and 8th inch. It doesn't seem to make a big giant difference to make them out of 3 32nd because they come out so smooth anyway, they need very little sanding. And once you have that extra little material and it's all glued in place, you can blend it in and take a little more sanding off of it. But anyway, for our purposes, I have a decent piece of eighth inch here. I'm going to get trim it out, rough trim it out, and get the ammonia ready so I can start getting this one molded up.
Kind of important doing your first mold, not to have too much wood overhanging, especially at the back. You got to do this maybe once or twice and figure out <clears throat> roughly how much of this wood is going to hang out. And I'm just eyeballing this up, figuring maybe I'm going to hit it right on the first shot. If you have too much wood hanging over, it tends to wrinkle up at the back and split. But pretty much you just got to eyeball it. Now a good way to figure this out is to kind of take the mold on one edge and keep in mind you want to go right even with the grain and kind of roll it across. Make sure you're not going to run out of wood. It's almost impossible, I found, to get one that has a joint in it and use it. I like to do it with four inch wood, even though four inch wood is a little harder to get. Remember the key here is not to worry about the weight of the wood. The wood is not going to be a significant you know, you're not going to save uh, an ounce using a thinner piece of wood. In fact, I'll get rid of these corners right now. Even this, if you left it hanging over, it's not a terrible thing. It just makes it more convenient. Okay, the next thing, i got to get out the ammonia and <clears throat> soak that up. Now, it doesn't seem to matter what brand of ammonia I've used. They all seem to work okay. Buy the cheapest one you can. Some is pure ammonia. Some has other chemicals. I don't know which is which. They both work okay. They'll both make you choke to death. It's a good idea, if you can, to go outside and soak your wood. I can't. I use the vacuum bench. But you definitely, you definitely don't want to breathe too much of this in. And if, you make it, if it makes you sick, a good second choice is to use Windex. Just use ordinary Windex and let it soak 10 minutes instead of this. This you can go right ahead in a minute. Let the Windex soak in. Now this is the step everybody hates because this really does stink and it really does get your hands smelly and everything but if you choose to go with Windex let it soak a little longer pour it right on if you can do it outside it just isn't convenient it's a rainy day today oh phew got to get the vacuum bench on phew. not a great idea either if, you, if you're prone to be sensitive to chemicals this will make you sick you could, and I've spoken to other people, Frank McMillan and Al Rabe, other people that have done this, what they say is possible is you can just use warm water or just use water, period. Well, but I know the ammonia really softens up the wood. Ammonia releases the wood cells, the resin that holds the cells together, and you can get right into it. You'll be able to do this on your first try with ammonia, I'm, I'm sure. In fact, I've never spoken to anybody that's watched one of these videos showing how to do the molding and not gone out and been able to make a molded part on the first try. I mean, it's not like working with fiberglass resin or anything. This is kind of easy. It's just smelly. I'm going to let this sit now for a minute or so. Let it soak on both sides. And you'll see how soft this gets. It'll get soft and pliable. It'll be ready to, ready to wrap around a mold. As you go along, you can kind of bend the wood into position, get it preformed, especially if you don't have real good A-grain wood. Just kind of feel it with your hands, let it start to flex. It's more than likely going to split right at the tail post as you work your way down. Perfectly okay, you can hot stuff it together. It won't mean anything to have that little split in the back. In fact, right here I see I got a knot in the wood right by the tail. If I knew that, I would have reversed the sheets, but didn't notice it kind of get this flexed into position. What I'm trying to do is show all the little tricks on this first one because as we get into the molding I'm not going to go back over this over and over again. This is stuff that worked well on a Spitfire. This is, and this is an eighth inch piece by the way. Again I don't think there's a big saving to doing 332nd unless you're a crazy man about making a plain light. Okay now see you can almost bend that wood right around. Now, sometimes you can bend the wood this way when it's dry but not always. So once I have it that way, let a little more soak in. That opens up the wood cells, just let it soak right in. In case you've never gotten an ace bandage. They make ace bandages that have a self-stick. They stick to themselves. They also make non, the ones that don't stick to themselves. Both work okay. I like the sticky ones better than the non-sticky ones. They also make Four inch and three inch, the real wide ones have some advantages. If you're real good with your hands, you may be able to use that to some advantage. This bandage, you can use these over and over again. It's a good idea to get a couple of them. They're cheap. They're only a dollar or so a piece. 
once you get into this trying to make molded parts, what I'm hoping is some of the new people, and we have several new people on board, they're going to come up with some ideas. Now, I got a lot of ideas from other people when I was working on a Spitfire. See how this sticks to itself? You want to get all the wrinkles out of it before you go wrapping. Otherwise, you wrap a wrinkle right into the wood. It'll sh that wrinkle will show. So this is just a little preparation. This won't happen the first time you do it, but after this has been sitting for a year, you want to get all the wrinkles out. Again, an awful lot of people contributed to what amounts to be uh, the Spitfire program. And anytime I can pass that information on, that's the object of all videos. Now it can be a real nuisance if you start out and you get the front wrap and the piece is going off like this and you start wrapping it, you never can get that correction. So before you really tighten up on the uh, uh, on any part of the mold, you want to try to get it centered. Again, the, le the least amount of overhang you can allow for is the best. And I'm going to start, since we have a taper in the bottom of this, I'm going to start about halfway. Not even halfway. I just want to get this loosely in place. I'm not trying to make this tight right now. This is just to hold it in place. And as I'm wrapping, I'll start making it tighter and tighter. takes a little bit of technique. You don't have to make this like, you know, like a bow and arrow. You don't have to make it that tight. You can see now I've already got the wood is already pressed up onto the mold. So I can go back over this, you can go right over the top of the ace bandage now, work my way to the other end. Now the other end of this is going to be mating to a fiberglass cowling. And the fiberglass cowling is really relatively thin, so I want to get a good match, a good contour up there. I don't want to have, now see here, I'm running out of wood already. If this gets that a lot of wood is hanging over the end of the mold, you might want to come by with a knife and just lop it off. Again, you don't have to make this so tight that it's, you know, it's a, yeah, just split now, but that's okay. We can CA that back. It just split. It's not the end of it. It split right by the knot where I said it would. As you get to the end, you know it's going to be a problem. The tinier you get to the back, the tighter it gets. You're wrapping almost into the quarter of the diameter. It just split now. But that split in the back means nothing. That can all be sanded out in the final product. And I'll just wrap this back. I'll go get another ace bandage. And then wrap the front with the other ace bandage. This sticks to itself, so there's no problem at all. One of the ace bandages that... that that doesn't have any of this sticky stuff on it. And what you can do with this one, I can get to the part where I have the the wrap already on. Once I get around this, now I can start wrapping toward the front. If you have a multiple curve like I have here, it's best to go from both ends, from start at the middle and work to both ends. You'll find that just easier to do. And usually you'll have no problem with the front. It's back by where the tail wheel is, or where the rudder is, that it tends to compress and break. But even if you split it, when you're done, you just squeeze it together, CA it, or you can run a little piece of scrap inside. Now, because this doesn't stick to itself, I have to put a pin in this. So I'll go back over the same area, just to use up the material. And now on the bottom, where nobody will see it, I can run a pin. I can just stick the pin in there. Now I can work this. Just keep squeezing it down. Again, I don't want it under 1,000 pounds of compression, because what will happen is it, it serves no useful purpose. It's going to conform to that shape in time. If it doesn't, I'll re-wet re the wood. Re-wet the wood. That's all, folks. It's conforming up to this size fine. Okay, now I can hang this by the hook to dry, and I won't come back to this till tomorrow, till this is all dry. See, another good tip is to just leave it hanging from a hook. See, there's a heating vent there. The heat will definitely be on tonight, 
and I like to let it sit overnight. I'm sure you could pull this out after a couple hours, but and I've I've tried heating it with a hair dryer to speed it up. It's best to leave it overnight up by a hair dryer. So I guess that's all I'm going to get to fool around with here tonight. This session is probably uh, coming to an end. Now one of the really scale features that I really like on this this model was the way the spinner treatment came out. This was really a tremendous amount of work. Ron Kiefer was, uh, of course, his instrumental. We made nine of these spinners up already. And I don't know that we're going to use those on the Seafire program or not. These were all hand laid up, little tiny set screws on them. And if you follow this, the Spitfire videos, of course, you watched as we wrestled with all the uh, incumbent little problems with the mold and everything. But this, this technology is pretty much in the bank. And I'm going to be making a new spinner for the Seafire. But one of the things I don't know for sure that I'm going to do or definitely not going to do yet, and I'm looking at all my options, I wanted to make it a little more scale-like, make the spinner maybe a quarter of an inch bigger in diameter. So what I want to do is reference off the books before I make a decision on this. And one of the things I did do was speak to Joe extensively, since he's going to be making the twin model to this. And he felt the same way. He didn't. He wasn't crazy about the K-Van plastic spinner. He liked this type of spinner. So I think what I'm going to do is try to make a decision really now as to what size spinner to use. And again, the, the Seafire has the Griffin blisters and diff, a little bit different treatment on the exhaust stacks. But this is one of the focal points on a model. So I do want to use my reference books and get a real feel for exactly what I want to do here before I actually go on to make the next step in the construction is to make up the nose ring before I make a decision on that. And this is the latest, well one of the latest nodes I got from Joe and if you notice it, this spinner shape to be really really scale like is just a little bit different than what we have on a Spitfire. It seems like the nose tapers up quite a bit into the bubble canopy. Of course we'll be able to do that with the molded top blocks and the Griffin blisters will add a little bit to that illusion. But you really can't have this shape and just have a true turn spinner. You really, it's just not one of the choices. So one of the things I did was I got out my box with all the spinners and I'm trying to replicate this shape just so I can make a decision now if I want to make this spinner bigger or smaller. This is, this is a very, very intricate part of making a plane. It looks like all you do is dial up 1-800 uh, dialer spinner it's anything but getting this shape and then the contour into the nose section is extremely important if this is going to come off as a really unique aeroplane now this is where having an extensive library of spitfire seafire literature comes in and again i have to thank all the people that contributed into this library and this shape it isn't as simple as you think and believe me ron and i wrestled with this mold so many times and because there's so many Spitfire Seafire variants I want to make sure I don't cheat myself putting on a Vico spinner here is not going to do it I really want to make sure I have this contour as close to being prototypical as possible now it's especially important because one of the things we want to have in combination with the Griffin blisters is the possibility of running again a five bladed prototypical prop And this is one of the beauties of doing a semi-scale model, is you get to research and look at all the little, the little things that might inspire you if you're building straight line stunners to get into something semi-scale and, and just make it a little more challenging than it normally is just to run off, you know, the average foam wing flat top block plane. This makes it just a little more exciting, a little more of a challenge. And get a little idea from this photo just how big that spinner is for the five bladed prop
again I'm really going to be giving a lot of thought here and I'll do most of it off camera of course exactly how I want to do this spinner I got to get out the box of spinners this will be a focal point of the plane like the canopy that requires a lot of thought again I just love having these books it's so helpful actually I really wanted to I could photo enlarge this up or have Joe do it but I really want to do this with a mind's eye because what I'm really making here is a character I'm not making an exact scale model I want to have that look and you can see what a nice profile these airplanes have these late model Spitfires and Seafires had a really nice side profile and I know Joe prefers the uh, the rudder he sent me the uh, the photo enlargement of his rudder but basically the fusees are going to be exactly the same and it's nice to have this many choices in fact looking at the bubble canopy version here you just get the idea like that really would make that paint job even would make an excellent stunt model but the spinner has to be right and that's the part I'm debating with right now Now what I want to do is from the spinner box I want to get out so I have on hand and you see what I've done over the past you know flying season Spitfire development has been uh, intensive by the way if you haven't seen all the Spitfire tapes that might be some that would have a general interest we still have a couple of loners laying around there's the five bladed prop five bladed spinner okay but, but one of the things to remember is you, you just can't overdo this. You just can't spend too much time thinking about exactly what you want to do on focal points of the plane. Now this will have no value at all. These are pointy. And what I did is I got a two and a half inch spinner from George from his RC collection. This one's are going to be of no value. I want to kind of get one of every size. These are the ones we made up last year. The extra ones that Ron made up. Again, these are really, really sexy and nice. But I want to have all these variations on hand. Vico, we're not going to use that. This one's too small, we're not going to use that. So I can start to play musical chairs and narrow this down. In fact, here's the five bladed one. I won't even take that out. I have an extra one. So we have a lot of choices now. In fact, we don't even need these. And when I cut up that nose ring now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the fuse. Well, in fact, where the hell is the fuse? I got it over on the rack. I know, for instance, that the three inch is going to be on the big side. You can see the contour is probably not far from wrong, but it's just too big. That's why I wanted to have one on hand anyway. The two and a half, and I don't know that I'm going to go to two and a half. This is probably even bigger but the shape isn't exactly right so more than likely I'm gonna wind up making my own mold I'm gonna to try to get some legs pantyhose and ha get a look at that contour but I still need to decide on the diameter and the only way to really do that is to is to lay this all out fuse full size with the drawing and kind of look at some of these different shapes right on the drawing again this is the rough draft that that I had made earlier using what what amounted to be the standard spinner that we already have eight or nine of and I haven't eliminated this but this is just one of those things is having this nose section just the way I want it with the exhaust the blisters the access panels the rivet lines this is the focal point of the plane this is not something you can just run off and do so being this this drawing has been back and forth to Joe and he's kinda of given it his approval I'm gonna look at well exactly what I can do here and more than likely I'm gonna wind up thinking about this overnight and before I actually make a decision this is the kind of stuff once I cut that nose ring and the next step will be to carve the cowling into place once I make that decision I really I can make it smaller but I can't make it bigger so what I'll do if I wind up being in doubt is I'll use one just a little bit bigger and then if I change my mind before I actually make the mold for the cowling I can come down and just a little bit in diameter Because why I wanted to have a three inch here just to look at it, get an idea of what it would look like. I, I just get the feeling that three inch is too big.
two and a half is probably just a little more realistic here. And even though the K van seems to, uh, well, we know it's the lightest of the spinners except for our, the Ron ones, it doesn't have the right contour for these late model Spitfires. And being these are both going to be late models, I think I kind of have narrowed it down to I'm going to try to use the same back plates the same diameter and this this took a lot of thought this was not a two minute job I want to have the same diameter so I can make up the plywood backplate rings I can do to actually I can do it right now and I probably will be going with this spinner that's going to be the one of choice here for right now I always like to make up the the nose ring out of because we're going to use this as part of the cowl hole down too what I try to do is lay out one, leave the ink line on. Don't saw the ink line off. That's part of this. Then what I'll do is I'll, well, i got to make this the inside hole bigger. What I'll do is I'll glue this one back to another piece of 16th plywood with the grain. See, the grain is going in this direction, the grain going this way. So in effect, I'll have eighth inch plywood, but rather than having the plies of eighth inch plywood, I'll have more plies because this is sixteenth, I'll have more grain directions and it'll wind up being a lot stronger. an excellent tip for getting that nice real nice spinner shape spinner side what I've done is I've left just a little bit of extra wood around the edge I want to leave the ink line on and I'll do that with the grindstone remember what I want to do is leave the line on I just want to take just enough material on because this will be my pattern for all the all of the pieces that I have to make and laminate. And I can use a Dremel sanding drum to clean up the inside. Leaving that little bit extra wood, I always want to see that pencil line, that ink line. I never want to lose that ink line. Then I know I'll have just enough that when I actually get the spinner in place, I'll have just enough to get that blend that it's perfect. And that's something they always seem to check in appearance judging every year at the Nats. Even the guys that don't know what the hell they're doing seem to check that. Leave the line on. It's much easier to do this than to do it with the, or try to do it with the Dremel tool. You sand the, you sand the line off. Time you mount the spinner, it's off by a, just enough makes you crazy now you can see just leaving that little line on this rest a little bit will have just a little bit of a flute angle to it to be really be scale I'll be very careful now in making up well I have to make four more of these and laminate them all together the whole trick here is get that first one perfect get plenty of sanding dust on the back of it because you're trying to laminate plywood let the dust thick CA and the dust kick it off. And I want to get the grain going in as many different directions as possible. The whole trick is to have the multiple grains going in various directions. Now you can actually use this as the pattern and use the edge, which is a little bit larger than the ink line, as an edge on the Dremel tool and I'll take this out this will be the pattern in to make the second one using the first one glued in place and then using the hard edge as a pattern is a good trick no matter any time you're going to do multiples always glue the first one to the second one don't cut them both out and then try to glue them together symmetrically doing it this way is a whole lot easier and you still want to see that incline for the whole time you're doing it now the last little tip and this is a good one once you have one part made with all the plies open, all of this end grain, you want to get it sanded down with some smooth paper and soak it with thin CA. That thin CA seals up the edge. The part will be twice as strong. Plywood doesn't really have a really 
high strength glue nothing like CA so what in, what in effect you're doing is sealing the plies at the edges especially up here where it'll take a lot of stress from the cowling the thin CA will soak in and make this a lot stronger and no heavier or very little heavier now you'll see from time to time I seal all the edges of everything with thin CA wiping it with q-tips along the way you don't think this is a significant thing flap edges rudder edges anything that has an edge it should be soaked with thin CA rub it with q-tips that kind of kicks it off at a nice slow rate really adds a lot of integrity now you can see a nice and accurate and sealed sealed edges a really nice part I get a final sanding on that double check once I'm real happy that everything is exactly the way I want, I've got that look that I want, that Spitfire look, I'm not going to trade that away. I'll make this other piece up off camera. Actually, that'll probably be it for tonight. But this is the kind of thing. If, if this was to be a little bit too small and you have to blend in the edge or if you put the motor in a plane and you see this, oh, man, the whole, the whole purpose gets defeated when you... It's all these little details. I've said that over and over in this se series of videos. The, the devil is in the details. All these little things that one by one by one just add up. Now in today's mail, while I'm waiting for all these molding parts to dry, and believe me, it's always better to let it sit an extra day. Got a nice set of pictures from Cesar Chacon in Argentina. And he's become, he's become a really good customer, has a lot of videos. He's been sharing it with all the guys in his club and he sent this nice set of pictures in now he's working you can tell by the, the craftsmanship here he's learned a lot from the videos I'm sure and it's, the letter that he sent is is like six pages long I'm not even gonna bother reading it but basically he's uh, real happy with a lot of the stuff that he's done uh, he crashed one of his earlier planes he says I'm just skimming through this he has a few flights on this guy it's an I-beamer kind of an original design and he's trimming it out he asked for some motor information. What I think I'll do is just send him the basic engines tape next time he orders stuff. A lot of nice workmanship. Look at, just as an example, all little details around the cowling. Nice, real nice spinner fit, something we're working on. Canted in gear. Nice paintwork, by the way. They just had the big championships in Argentina, and he sent me a bunch of mementos little things to uh you know i got a hat in fact i got a uh, a map of how to get to argentina well i try to hit all the local contests but to tell you the truth argentina just a little bit out of karen's range but i'll bet you any money if there was an antique store down there she would uh we would be on our way to argentina anyway if i remember right this was this was kind of roughed out from a uh, a jim armor design the epic just seeing the lettering on the wing reminded me. But look how nice the workmanship is. And of course it's a take apart plane. We've had pictures of this in raw wood on the previous videos, on the Spitfire videos. Now I'm going to send him a nice letter and a nice package back, needless to say. But this is one of the things that the videos, I mean we are, we have videos in Germany, France, Australia, New Zealand, Switzerland, now Argentina, I know Brazil, South Africa, Puerto Rico. Is Puerto Rico a foreign country? And one of the things these videos allow you to do is just share the hobby in a unique way. This this is so much nicer than just having a magazine with dog-eared uh, castor oil stains on it a year later. I don't know. I just I just and you can't make copies of a magazine. I know you guys out there making all kind of bootleg copies, boy. I don't have to get get somebody after you anyway. Check out the hat. This is the main thing. Caesar sent me this hat. I have a real dilemma here. I have the Philly Flyers hat from DeJulia and I have this hat. The Philly Flyers hat is so far a good luck hat. I don't know about the black hat, but uh, hey. Anyway, thanks a lot. Hope you're enjoying the videos. I'll make sure you get a copy of this down in Argentina. Please, share the videos with all the guys down there. Come up, come up to our nationals. Come up like the guys did from Puerto Rico and share the hobby with us.
Now this actually sat here two days, which is always better. The longer the better. Now before we mold up another one, obviously we want to do a little test and see if this is oversized or undersized or just right. Sometimes it'll just tend to stick. You can see we got a split in the back. Easy to repair stuff at this point. Now you can see the little line, the impression that the uh, the wire leaves in there, and that is the critical thing because pretend you didn't have that that wire line in there now. How would you get that nice smooth transition in the fuselage? How to, how would you do that? It'd be difficult. Now you can see we have a split in the wood which we'll see a shut. There's also another split back here. This is typical, and what I do is I just kind of squeeze it together, CA it, maybe even run a little piece inside if I have to. It's not really a big a big deal and it's nothing to worry about. The main thing is we have a shell that's super light. And that in the time it would take to hollow a normal block out, I can make four or five of these, and plus I still have it, I can make them over and over and over and over and over. So I really think this is a big improvement. This is something worth doing. Even just for the fun of doing it. It's it's a real nice way to model. There's no carving chips. There's no, uh, it's really kind of simple. Anyway, I'm going to trim this all off now. Get a nice sharp number 11 blade, trim this all off. And then I'll get it block sanded nice and flat. And of course, make sure it fits. Now I want to repair that little crack that I had so before I trim this out I want to make all the little repairs now I got that that what amounts to be a big split here so what I'm going to do is v-notch it out again this is nothing fancy make a v-notch just so I can join these pieces as close as possible this is all going to get final sanded out anyway in the final product. See now I've tried to v-notch that out so I can just get this to, to join together. And there's so much material here because it's eighth inch I can just recontour it out. Also you see the little, the little indentations? from having this on the mold well we're going to sand them all out later that'll be easy to do that's just just typical when you have relatively soft wood but getting these joints all joined together before we actually go and make the trim it's important otherwise this will not might not be accurate now once you get the mo the big the chunks out with the exacto you can double up a piece of sandpaper put it in a groove and kind of squeeze it together and this will give you a nice final fit. It just makes for a good accurate mating surface. A good way to make this repair is to get the repair up, pressed together, put a little tape around it. This, this has worked well for me in the past. It also keeps the thin CA from spilling out onto the outside of the fuselage and making a big bubble down the edge. Again, all these little things go into making it that it's real easy to do. It's not, uh, not a big deal. Again, that little dust that you leave inside there, that's a big help. Right now, we're not overly concerned with maintaining a, you know, 64th of an inch. We have plenty of material here to do the final sanding on. And if you didn't have this, this radical contour in the back, I'll put a little extra on it, you wouldn't have to worry about this. And you can see how that just kind of blends in. When you're all finished, you got a ridge here. Because you just sand and, and knock that right down, no problem. Boy, when you balance this against how much work it would be to, at least for me, to hollow out a block is the better part of a day. And there's always a ridge. For right now, just getting it down rough is, is plenty close. There's plenty of material in there.
And we're not going to even worry about those little ridge lines yet. So we get this, we'll put this back on a mold and sand it later. This is obviously, this is a really good place to have a brand new number 11 blade. Get your close-up glasses on. I'm trying to follow right down that line. The closer I can follow that line, the less sanding I'll have to do. And it leaves plenty of an indentation. Believe me, when I look back at the Spitfire project, and if you haven't seen all those videos, it might be a good idea to scam up a couple of them. There's a lot of good molding technology on them. And this one, I hope we're going to be able to make the molding even more practical, more easy, more user-friendly. Now, of course, you never get this to be a real nice edge. We're going to, that's why we have that sandpaper on the table. But just ripping it off, if anything, leave a little bit extra on is always a good idea. I'll do the other one off camera, and we'll be ready to get that flat surface in there, to, a nice flat, plain surface. Now the trick here is not to press down in any one spot, but you can see as I'm moving, these are very delicate at this point in time. I'm moving my hand, constantly moving just a little bit just to get that nice flat edge. Now this is where it's an advantage to have eighth inch shells, because at this point in time, if these were 332nd, they'd be even more delicate. They're delicate enough as eighth inch until you get them mounted. They are on the delicate side. Now what would be real nice if you had a big enough piece of sandpaper, and a good way to do that is to get a sanding belt from a Sears Roebuck. A 48 inch sanding belt is a good way to do this, but this will do. For right now, this is plenty good. It doesn't have to be any better than this. And I found from experiment that roughly 220 grit is just about right for a job like this. Now you want to look and see when you're just getting down to the very end, there'll be some last little, um, little chinks in it, but you sort of don't want to go any further than you have to. Okay, get a little look at how that came out. And you have a nice edge here now, a nice flat edge that they're both parallel, of course you've made them off the table. This is ready to glue on and you have just enough of a little extra material to blend that edge in. Now I'm going to get back here later. This is, this is one of those crazy days. I got about a thousand errands to do. But when next time I get back, I'll sand this right on the shell. Put this piece right up on the shell and be ready to get a nice final sanding on it and do a little test fit onto one of the fusies. Now tonight I wanna just put this right down on the shell. I don't wanna press it down too hard. I'll take it over by the sanding bench. You can see that I've got a pretty good line relative to the wire. I don't think we've missed any spots here. I don't remember if we did. Yeah, we did the bottom. I want to take this over to Sanding Bench and just get all of the little tooling marks from having that bandage wrapped on here off. Now I can kind of just hold it in position roughly. I'm not looking to lighten it up. I'm just looking to get all the little marks that the bandage has left. You really don't have to make those bandages ultra, ultra tight like a tightrope. But this allows you to get a lot of the sanding done before you ever even get it in position. And the next step is going to be to figure out the cowl block angles, get the block out. So as I'm doing this, this will be a little time consuming. Spend five, ten minutes doing this. I can start thinking about the next step. 
And that's another thing that I know through the videos a lot of people pick up is like the logical steps of making a plane. Keith Ferguson brought that up one time. And he said the biggest thing he got out of watching the videos was just the steps, step one, step two. Well, you get the steps, and at least these are the typical things that have evolved in my building. And I've built a few planes in my time, but I've always, always tried to make it easier and easier so there was nothing left to chance. And I think we're closing in on just about having that, maybe even on this set of videos that you really don't have a lot you know, just miss, like mystery meat. Kind of makes sense. Each step follows logically into the next one. So when you pull this off the shell, you've got your final, you just can see this. It's... Well, you can even see that little piece that we repaired where that repair is. You see how it just... It's not even a factor in the final the final sand out. And then I just do the rest of this, I just fudge this in by hand. That's why I suggest you start by making eighth inch shells instead of 332nd. This edge is gonna get angled back, so I'm not even concerned with that, but I'd say that's that's a really, really reasonably I don't know how in God's name you could even hope to carve something that that thin and have it strong and have it that you don't have little low spots have you ever carved a block and you got little spots where you poke through and everything oh it's such a pain in the ass remember al rabe saying if you don't go through a top block four or five times it's not light enough well maybe that's not completely true i don't know these don't have any poke throughs in there i you're never going to make anything lighter than this no i did a little test fit on one of the fuses there and they should be or in theory they would be interchangeable but of course now before I mold up another piece I want to make a very strong decision here if this piece was on the small side I would put some ball saw masking tape on a mold so this would spread the next piece I mold and I just use this one as a scrap if the piece was too big if it was on the big side then all I need to do is take sand the mold down so that the final molded shell drops right in place and there isn't a whole lot of wood showing on either side, and it lines up. It looks like it lines up real nice, at least from here. And I'm ready to get the mold ready, wet up another piece, and I, I think I can go with the mold exactly like it is and mold up the second shell. Now, the best thing I know is I don't even want to tack glue this on. It's such a good fit. I think masking tape will hold it in position. Plenty good. And what I'm, what I'm going to try to do now is just get this piece cut off and get a flat edge block sanded in here. Now from here I can see that I'm going to have to, I'll just cut some of this off with an X-Acto knife and then get a block, a nice flat block and get the final, final angle in with a sanding block. Of course, you have to get the last little bit with a block or else you run the risk of overcutting it. Now see, I poked this little piece up trying to get too cute. Anyway, what I'm going to do, I'll CA that back and I want to CA this edge nice and hard. Again, this is a C8 edge, this is a C8 edge, but I don't want to join the pieces together. Now it may seem like overkill to get these edges all CA'd, but I like getting them CA'd as early as possible. It leaves a nice edge on here. Now also on the edge, I like to get a little bit down here where I did that little patch. Of course, they all sand right in. This just hardens up the wood gives me a little edge to work with while I'm doing a cowling. Okay, the next step is I want to put my shell on. 
Just make sure I haven't got any distortions. I have a reasonably good fit. And on the final fit, I'll get the last little bit out. The next thing, I have to get the motor in place and get the one of the nose rings on, and then I'm ready to lay out my cowl block. Now, when I go to set the nose ring, I always try to just cock the engine with, even though it's really at zero here, just a little bit of offset so that that nose ring, I know most planes, when you do the final trim and you get down to the nitty gritty, they need a little bit of motor offset. So if anything, I'll have it, if it isn't exactly neutral, it'll be just a little bit outboard. And that's important when setting up that nose ring if you want that nice cowling fit. Now I'm just going to do a little dry fit here. Make sure I have a little bit of clearance. Now if this is a little bit tight and it looks like that's what the case is here, I want a little more clearance than this. I have to take a block and just carefully block sand off just enough. I'm trying to establish that I have about five to ten thousandths of clearance behind a spinner and a spinner ring and that'll make up for the paint and the variation in the crankshaft lengths. Now I know what I'm looking for here is just about ten thousandths of clearance. I'm, over, I'm actually at zero right now. So what would happen if I left it like this, I would paint it and then it'd be an interference. So I'm putting a nice solid mark on the motor mounts that's actually a little bigger than 10 thousandths because I want to have a little extra clearance in here. And I can take this over to the belt sander and just dress this off so the nose ring has just the right amount of clearance when it's bolted in place. I can actually use the spinner back plate to hold this in position and get this real accurate. Now picture what happens if this is cocked off to one side, up, down, off that way, off that way. Getting this ring in place is an ultra critical thing. Ultra critical. take just a little bit off and go do a dry fit and do it over and over. Don't take so much off that you're... Now with the table at 90, it also gives me one of the angles that I need to have right. Now what I actually try to get is the clearance just right here. And of course, if you started out and you had too much, if the mounts were, were shorter than they should be, it's always a good idea then you could put a little shim in here, maybe 64th plywood or so. But you'd like to get it that actually the spinner back plate holds this in place. It looks like we're closing in on it after two or three dry fits here. And we'll have just enough around the whole thing. Now you can see what I'm trying to do here up on the macro lens. I want to get the clearance flat up on a nose ring. I have the a little shim in here just to hold the back plate in place. Now what I'll do is I'll, sh I'll stick IBM cards all around the perimeter of the back plate and that'll hold the nose ring in place and I'll be ready to tack glue it in place. Now you want to have this shimmed and this is an IBM card folded back which when it's finished will give me about ten thousandths of clearance. You want to make sure your intention on all the shims because this will give you a final set. And boy, there is nothing more frustrating. You finish a plane, you go to put it together for the final time, you put the spinner on and it rubs on the back plate. If you don't have that clearance in there, then you grind off the paint. Then oil soaks into the fuselage. Ma, oh, what a pain in the ass. This is a good way to do it. Now, obviously, if you needed to, you could grind a little extra. I've done a couple of dry fits here to get this just right. Now the last thing is I want to make sure I have the alignment, the same amount on all sides and I really can do that by feel more than anything else. And then I'm ready to just tack, just tack glue it in place, take out the shims 
and run the run the uh, feeler gauge around it and make sure I have the exact clearance, whatever that clearance that you choose is. And I think about ten thousandths is about right. And you always want to tack it in place first. Let let that kick. Now what you want to do is pull off all the shims and make sure you have exactly, exactly that nice smooth taper from the front forward. How I'll save the shims, because I'm going to be doing another nose ring soon, I can use these shims over and all. It's just an ordinary IBM cord, cardboard. Now you can use a feeler gauge to check that you have equal clearance and you can still make a correction before you do the permanent glue. Now what I'm looking at is I want to make sure I have the same clearance around the whole side. And I can even do that by feel here. Now what I always do is because I'm going to be using this to carve the cowling block and I want to beef this up a little bit. So inside I'll take a little scrap block just to beef up this while I'm working on it. I'd like to just get that stabilized. It's really on there, kind of precarious, until you get the final glue in there. And a little, I just a little piece of scrap is fine. Yeah, that looks fine. Looks like we got the clearance on that real nice. Right in here is where it's always good to get just a little, little piece of scrap, a little triangle piece right in there. Now, we had choices like on the Spitfire, what we did is we rounded the mounts and the doublers. Well, on this one, we wanted to leave that meat up front. I wanted to leave this because it was a wider fuselage, and I'm going to have a little bit different taper in the front. Remember, this is a different, different fuselage, but obviously, if you're making a cardinal or something, you might want to bring that in. So to make up for that, I want to make a little block in here. Remember, this nose section is going to be relatively flat and then dive into a spinner and have big valve covers here. So I wanted to have those plywood doubles. I didn't want to have them curve in. That was the whole method to my madness here. Anyway, I'll make up another block, get that other one done off camera, and then we can get a real close look at how we're going to marry up, get the block in place, and get the cowling block roughed out. Now we can get everything up here permanently CA'd in place, get a little extra around the nose ring. Just getting rid of some extra motor mount material here with the sanding drum. The next thing I got to do is make up a little tool. This is just a piece of scrap wood, and I want to get that angle for the cowling in here and get some of that sticky back sandpaper on here. And this is going to be my tool to get that edge right up to the nose ring. Otherwise, if this is square, you're going to constantly be whacking the nose ring. So I grind this off to get exactly that angle and get some sticky back sandpaper. And this will then be my sanding tool for the cowl angles. I've just been test fitting this to get exactly that cowl angle and then just a little more so I can get right up in a corner. Now if you're not already using this sticky back sandpaper, it's a good idea to pick some up. Different grits, this is 120. What I do is I want to lay my tool right out on here so I get the maximum length and just a little bit sticking back. Now let me just get back sixteenth of an inch. It's a real handy tool to have. Now I'm able to lap this back 
And now what I have to do is just get a razor and trim this off. And this I can use this for the whole, the whole opera, any operation that has to do with that cowling. See now having that angle in there, get right up in the corner. of doing this cowling I can constantly use this tool just to dress off that edge so I get that real nice parting line and as a reference I just want to now this is a year old model with many many flights nice straight even parting line every step of the way we worked on that parting line And just looking at some of the other models with the parting line, real nice after after many years of flying. But getting it that way, you need to make a tool up. You can't just do this at random. Now again, as I go every step of the way, I want to get some thin CA on here. I've got this dressed off now. It's back down to raw wood. Get some thin CA in here just to harden it up to hold it in position while I get the next part of this done. And this is another one of those devil in the details things. I just, I always want to keep this edge. Every time I get it down to raw wood, I'll reharden it. And just get the extra off. Oh, this is kicking fast. Yeah, a lot of dust on it. When you see those nice edges, those edges aren't a random thing. You got to work on them. And what I do, I use that tool now to get this angle just right. And I can tape on the bottom block at this point. And now I'm just going to see a just this little tip here because I'm going to be working at angle. Now in the very end of the block I tack glued this on. I, I wanted to keep this from springing. I, this will act like a little former back here. This, this was already starting to spring a little wider. I didn't want to use tape to force it down. So I just made up a little piece of scrap. I'll trim this off and this, I'll leave this former right at the end of the block. Now I check this angle with the tool, get this pretty much where I want it. I'm only tacking the front here. This is just, just so I can get the cowl block to blend in the way I'd like. Now one advantage of using a, a molded glass cowl, composite cowl, I don't need a good block. In this case I can use up one of my scrap blocks. And what I'll do is I'll just get a rough shape here of what I want, cut three of these out on a jigsaw, laminate them together. I don't really care if it's a real nice, neat block. It's not important, because I'm not really going to use the block. The block is just going to be the plug for the mold. Now, I remember in the old days, before making up molds, getting into panic mode about now that you didn't have a light enough or a nice enough block. You know, boy, I don't miss that a bit. Now this will roughly be the shape I'm looking for here. And I'll leave it a little bit oversized, if anything. In fact, I can even put the taper in it here. Now I got kind of, most important thing is to get a nice angle in here. And I guess I can do this, just laminate enough pieces up. I got enough scrap here. Just laminate them up out of scrap pieces. We're, we're only going to use that for a plug. But that beats the hell out of having to cut up a $20 top block. I'll just join all these pieces together. 
Again, most of this is going to get carved away, so I'm not being too fancy about it. Thick CA to join the blocks, and then what I do is most of all, most of all, get them pressed on a flat glass table because we want to get that angle up in the front real accurate. I want to get that edge perfectly flat as a reference point to start with. Well, President Nixon. That is a definite advantage to making the block wider than it has to be. The reason is when you get the front angle sanded in, which I did on a belt sander, now I can press this in and get a real nice tight fit, trace in my spinner outline, which which now is going to be my reference point. Now when I spin this over, I guess it's easier to do it this way, I can get a rough idea where my cowl is going to end. Make sure I have plenty of wood on all sides. Beautiful. I can just tack glue this in place and then start shaving it away. The key thing you want to do is make sure that that nose ring is nice, a nice tight fit and a nice edge line. We're going to line it with 64th ply, but you don't want to start with this all off. Now, if you didn't make it a little bit extra wide, you'd find out the nose ring would line up real nice. And you went here, and this would be off to one side. So always make it a little bit wider than it has to be. And in this case, since it's a plug, the grain doesn't matter. But having a grain go in this direction will keep it from twisting and, and rippling up when we start to carve it. I just want to tack this in position. Usually one dot is all you need. I want one dot up around the sheeting, of course. Now even if the edge right now isn't exactly perfect like it is here, we're going to fill that in with 64th plywood, so... And then we'll use the actual the actual composite cowl to sand the fuselage in. So if anything, we'll leave a little extra meat on the fuselage and get the cowl contours the way we want them. Now, of course, I want to start with a nice new number 26 blade and just start roughing this out. I don't want to put tape on a fuse because I'm going to do a lot of tapering. But for sure, I want to take it off in small slivers till I get the outside contour close to where I want it to be. And no substitute for just doing it nice and slow. And I don't want to take any more of the fuse side off. And I really have to. I don't want to make get the fuse side down to being a sixteenth of an inch. I've seen a lot of people do that, by the way, and they think the idea is Oh boy, I got this really lightened up. Well, what you really have is 16th inch fuse sides, and probably that would result in not the greatest motor run in the world, even if you had a max FP. So I don't want to take any more off than I have to, except for that last little bit where it, it blends in. I try to work both sides a little bit, just to quite a bit of little little chiseling away here till I get the shape that I'm looking for in my mind's eye. So you want to be real careful not to get close to that shell because there's not much material there. I want to keep this all neat as possible. Now usually the most difficult part is to get this to contour up and into where the motor mat the motor uh, air intake will be. So I really don't want to take too much material off here. I want to get that, that little reverse swoop in there. I 
And it's this little action here. This is this is always the most difficult part to get just right, is that, that little curve back in at the ring. I'll try to get off with the sanding block over by the by the uh, dust machine. I got most of it done, most of the roughing out done with the uh, number 26 blade. This is good. You can get a lot of this, the rough stuff roughed out with that little tool we made for the cowl. And the part that's difficult, I want to get that to blend in. I also want to be real careful when I'm doing this area. I don't want to thin out the bottom block any more than I have to. Getting this little reverse curve, the dowel, piece of copper tubing. Uh, sticky back sandpaper. just goes in and makes it a little sharp angle. It's that little flute that makes it look real, I think makes it look real nice. I'm doing is I'm just knocking down this corner with the belt sander as much as I can. It's just a lot easier. Well, let's get it from the front. A lot easier to knock that off than it would be to uh, you know to do it by hand. And this is going to be covered by those those larger valve covers. It's a different different nose section in the Spitfire. So I'm trying to improvise around here. I want to have all that motor mount meat around when I actually make the little valve covers. Possibly. Some the now I've got basically the top contour. That belt sander actually worked pretty good to get this. I just was constantly working this angle. And I'm just going to dress this off a little bit. This is kind of getting to be the end of the day. We have company at the house today. And uh, actually I'm all sanded out, if you know what I mean. So rather than rushing and trying to get a, a finish on this, I think I'm just going to get the rest of this, the light sanding done, call it a night, and pick this up with to, tomorrow. I got kind of that angle that I wanted in there. Again, it's sometimes you just have to go back many times, getting that flute shape in there. All right, that's it for for this session. Now. I was surprised how well a belt sander worked. That one of the thoughts I did have is it would be nice if 
right at this point in time I carved the top lock did all this carving and everything but one of the things I want to do I'll do it off camera I want to get the other the other piece of sheeting into the mold because once I make the mold for this cowl of course I can just crank one out uh, every time the drying time is finished and I'll have the cowls done and the and the top lock in a relatively short time so I'll work on this more tomorrow hey see you later alligator Uh, cool in today's <laughs> today's mail these are photos from George Enot I never say this poor guy's name right I'm sure every time he watches this on tape and he sees a lot of these tapes he says ah oh, you never say my name right it's Enot okay Eno Enot enough anyway check the sale plane out and there's a reason I'm showing this he sent me a whole bunch of let's see one two three free flight videos and I have some indoor footage that just came in I want to review that. Always, always interested in sharing that footage, by the way. Now, take a real close look at the pilot, because George has volunteered, and I hope he hasn't forgotten that he volunteered, to uh, to do us up some Sea Fire pilots. And this is one of the things that, assuming we're going to have a a canopy that opens up, this is the this is the the pilot in the sailplane. It's done with oil colors. And he really looks like he really has a headlock on. I don't know. I like this shot. I like the look of this. I remember John Davis had a really nice stunter one time with one of these glass noses like that. In fact, one of the things we're planning on Don Patterson's next plane, his Cardinal, we're going to do a glass nose like that. One of the things and you'll be seeing on the future. Don't go away mad. Any, <clears throat> anyway, thanks to George and we'll... <coughs> Excuse me, we'll check out these. I uh, see there's one on electric flight, one on astro flight. Some nice videos, and I really appreciate that George shares all this stuff with us. We really, especially on Monday night when we sit around here with uh, not, nothing too intelligent to do, uh, the videos really are a special piece of Monday night. Thanks a lot, George, and I'll get these back to you as soon as, uh, you know, I review all of them. Thanks a lot. Well, this morning I opened up the mail and I got a, uh, a package here. I'm going to put this on the tape of photos from Sam Sharota, but I want to make a, a real good point first. Now, Sam at the last Nats, if you've looked at the Nats videos, Sam is, uh, if not a future concourse winner, he's going, to, he's going to be in the front row a lot of times. The planes are beautiful. He, he knows an awful lot about paint and thinner. He has even sent me paint and thinner to test. Um, I really appreciate the fact that uh, he's agreed to do, and, I, and I, I know he's working on it right now. We're going to try to work on it a little bit together, maybe even get John Pothier to uh, edit it down for us professionally. Uh, a finishing article of his own. And believe me when I tell you, I look around at each Nats, and, and I try to see who are the up-and-comers that are really making progress in this, the world of finishing and building. I really don't like to speculate on a fly-in, there's too many politics involved to, uh, to make that judgment. But beautiful planes are beautiful planes and you can, you just leave it up to your fellow pilots and they pick the best one, you don't, you can skip the middle step. So anyway, I, it's my feeling that Sam is one of those people that like Midgley and Borelli and uh, Bill Rich was, he's already an accomplished uh, finisher, and many, many other people that have... <coughs> basically looked at a lot of videos, picked up some ideas, and I feel a little bit of pride when I see their planes in the front row or whatever. I don't even know how to describe it, but Sam is now one of those people. He has videos. He's contributing back into this little uh, database that we have, and I want to put these, this came today. He's working on a more extensive thing, and like I said, I feel having seen his Cobra and the, the, la the blue plane that he had last year, I feel it's only a matter of time. He really be, will be one of those people that's an absolute top-level finisher. And speaking of that, it's Saturday here. Mike Kajeski is due to come in and put some clear on his Magnum. It look, I looked out at the weather today. It looks like we'll get a day. So we'll probably do a little bit of work with Mike. I want to take care of this stuff. And we'll be ready to start hollowing out this cowl and maybe getting the holes cut and doing some work on the mold. So let me get Sam's stuff. And by the way, I want to thank Sam again. He seems like, like I, uh, I don't even know the right word, a guy who would contribute back into the, uh, the little database that we have. And I hope, I'm going to send him a copy of his video. I hope he, he in turn will keep feeding us good ideas, especially, <clears throat> oh, I'm sick this morning, 
especially if we do arrive at that place in time that I hope we never do get to where we can't buy lack of thinner, we can't buy paint, and we need people like Sam to try to improvise, come up with some new materials, some new ideas. So let me put this on the tape and then we'll get on with the uh, cowling job. <clears throat> now I, I know most people might not, well, most people uh, won't even recognize this, but this new camera that we're using does have a much better macro lens, so when it comes to do photos like this, they seem to come out a lot clearer. Anyway, I'm going to read right off of Sam's uh, list here. This is photos one, two, and three. Shows the model in silver and wet sanded down to a smooth base using 3M400, then 600. This was after covering it with medium weight silk span. Now, Matt, that's a significant thing, medium weight silk span, as opposed to zero, zero. We all used to years ago try to use zero, zero, and uh, I think the results were mixed. But the medium will definitely, in the long run, be a better investment, at least I feel. Then sprayed with four coats of light coat clear. Wait three days, sand lightly. Followed by spraying three coats of sanding sealer. One third talc, one third clear, two thirds thinner. Now again, this is what uh, pretty much the formula that I use. But but again, nobody's taking credit for inventing this. This is kind of traditional technology. And I'll just as I'm doing this, I'll put in the next picture just so this doesn't get too boring to watch. Anyway, if you look at some of the detail here, it looks like Sam has X ribs, which kind of a unique thing. And you can see the white spots where he's almost sanded through. This is traditional. Talc is a good filler. It tends to be heavy. Two, two coats of light coat to, to seal a seal. And notice I said sprayed, not brushed. Needless to say, it makes for a smoother distribution of the product. Well, I tend to brush it because I'm going to sand it out anyway, but that's certainly not a bad idea. In fact, to tell you the truth, Sam, we may try that on a sea fire when it comes time to do that. And I know people like Joe Adamusco, uh, not Joe, I'm uh, sorry, Billy Simons, have sprayed all of the stuff. So... It's a good idea to let the wet or dry sandpaper sit in water with one or two drops of dishwashing detergent overnight before using. The sandpaper becomes more pliable by losing its stiffness and is much easier to use. At this point, care should be taken to sand off. Let me go to the next picture here because I'm, I'm losing my... I'm trying to go right off of Sam's letter. At this point, care should be taken to sand off as much silver as possible. By that, I don't mean a be aggressive, be patient. My method of sanding is to sand one part of the model at a time. Example, and by the way, that's the way I do it. Example, sand the top half of the wing until you're satisfied, then go to another section. Don't jump around on a model. Never jump on a model, Sam. You know, a little sanding here, a little sanding there, that rate you never get done. I agree with that. You should do one flap, one elevator, one nose section, or whatever. It will be shoddy work, and your model will show it. If you find yourself doing that, just calm down. Photos four and five. It took me about a week to figure out what color to paint this thing. And by the way, that's one thing I always have a problem. When I'm doing a cardinal or something where I have a lot of choice in color, <laughs> I really, the day I paint it, sometimes I change my mind. I would stare at it for hours thinking, how about red? How about blue? I know Midgley does this with his neon colors. He wants to be Paul Walker so bad. How about this? How about that? I was in total confusion. Then they had a huge custom car show at the Iowa State Fairgrounds in Des Moines. There were about 1,100 beautiful cars on display. Every color combination and design you could think of. After roaming around for a while admiring stuff, I saw a beautiful cream-colored custom car with bronze pearl and russet pearl design. With a little pearl teal outlining, I thought, that's it. I found my colors. Now, I know Midgley, you know, I'm not telling tales from school, but I know Midgley's the same way. He's always painting light bulbs and painting his nose and stuff. Okay, pictures six and seven. I cut out a stencil for the AMA name and numbers, and here you can see the stenciling that he's got. I cut out a stencil for the AMA numbers, then I use rubber cement. Now, we've done that on a video. Method of applying it, Jimmy Casal was the first one I saw. He used that method, and it, it works fine. It's okay. You use it only if you're going to outline, of course. I airbrushed the top half of the letters and numbers with bronze pearl, the bottom half with russet pearl. Russet pearl has a little more red to it. Both colors complement each other. Let me go to picture seven. This is kind of neat. You can see this, this guy coming of age here. Design on a wing masked off with 3M fine line. This tape leaves a nice sharp edge anyway. So far, so good. And I do the same thing, of course. 
pictures 10 let me get let me get up with the pictures here so you can kind of see what he's talking about pictures 10 11 and 12 show the stab with the design outlined in pearl teal let's go right up to that one again a custom car show is an excellent place to get ideas custom vans another one you can see in this set of photos some of these and I know anybody, I, I'm sure Walt Prey has, a, has his own unique little system. Everybody seems to have a little system. The nice stars, kind of like a uh, old Jimmy Casal, Paul Walker kind of thing. All outlined, I'm just about finished. But from there I put some simple ink lines and flaps on the flaps and a little on the rudder. Here's his ink line photos. Now comes the good part. After everything was done, it was shot with apricot mylar flake over the whole model using a rustic look that looks a rustic look that <clears throat> Boy, I'm gonna die today a rustic look that dances in the sun like you can't believe as you walk around the model the mylar flake will flicker till it turns fire red I'm sorry to picture that I sent you it does not give the look it deserves oh yes the final clear coat is prestige wet sanded with 600 then 1500 wet or dry rubbed out with 3m finesse it And I'll just run through now. He sent a couple more of these pictures, so you can get a little, little look at it. Sam, just a couple of comments here of my own. This looks really awesome, but watch out when you make a model with a whole lot of overhang. A whole lot of overhang, the plane tends to weather vane in the wind. Again, this really looks pretty. And now what I'll do is I'll save the best for last. This is, this is actually a picture of Sam here. And Sam, I really, I really have to tell you, thanks a lot for sharing everything with us. And I look forward to reading and putting on a video your finishing article. Whenever you have it, send it down and we'll, we'll make it a guest column. Get me off the hook for one session here doing that crash repair stuff. But I don't want to crash anymore either, Sam. Thanks a lot. Okay, the next step here is to get a nice new razor blade. Take, take a brand new 11 or a razor, pop this. I want to get this block out, put the motor in, and hollow out as much as I have to and see where all my holes are going to come out. Again, remember, this is wider than the Spitfire by quite a bit, and the whole contour of this is more in keeping with, with what I hope is going to be the look of the Seafire rather than where the Spitfire was really narrow and pointy and racy. This is this with the big valve covers, the Griffin valve covers, I'm looking for a whole totally different look than I had with the uh, with the Spitfire. Now, of course, the idea is is to maintain a nice, neat, straight line. Even though we're going to edge this with 64th plywood, we don't want to make it any any nastier right now than it has to be. And all these little flakes I can just dig right out. Now here's where it pays to have that tool with the little point. I can get right down in there. Any of the little balls that it wound up staying on this edge, the smoother I can keep that edge all through the building and sanding, the better off I'll be. Anywhere I had a dot of glue, that's where it tends to be, uh, you get a little, a little one of those dots. And the first thing I want to do before I even go any further is harden up this little edge, because this is really going to take a beating. As I'm doing a carving and sand, and I don't want to lose that edge because when I make the mold, that piece will be, that little imperfection will show up. I also just want to get the edge here. Again, it's that same thing I keep talking about all through the videos. If you lose the edges, boy, that's, sometimes you see a beautiful model that's really a first class finish and all the edges are rough. You know, it really looks lousy. 
You know, this way you get at least a half a fighting chance of keeping those little edges. Edges of flaps, edges of elevators, edges of cowls. And this one is especially important. I don't want to have a rough edge on here. But again, it'll transpose up into all of the molded parts. This edge right here I'd like to keep nice and neat. And I'm, I have a chunk missing from when I pull this off the nose ring, but I can fill that in with some kind of filler before we actually do the casting. Remember, there's some golden rules. The golden rule here, and it, it never gets violated, the cowling should always be as small as possible. And I think we've accomplished that. Those big Bombay drop-away cowlings, or when you're using a tune pipe and you've got no structure in the back of the body here, it's always a problem. This is always better to have this whole nose section rigid as can be. If I could make this cowling even smaller, I would. I want to go back here and just reseal all these edges. A lot of this stuff, it may seem like overkill, but it isn't. In the final product, when you have that really nice line, this is tack glued up here, you have that really nice line and everybody looks and they don't know how you did it. They're, I know I never could figure it out years ago. I'd see an example was Stan Powell's Dove was perfect. And I said, how the hell did he do that? God, it made me crazy. Now, Exacto makes a big gouge and a small gouge. I usually have a couple of these. The big ones are good for roughing it out, and I can finish it off with the Dremel tool if I have to. But these are good tools you want to have if you've never used them before for doing this kind of hollowing. This is, this is probably uh, the only reason we're really going to hollow this even. Don't need these for the blocks. The only reason for hollowing the cowl is to make sure the motor fits. And it's just a safety thing. I just don't want to mold up cowlings and the motor doesn't fit. Okay, now since I'm not using this actually as a cowling, if it was a cowling, I'd make this an eighth of an inch. I want to leave this even a little more. Maybe a quarter of an inch would be a realistic number. I'm only hollowing this out so I can get the motor in position. Even leave a little more back by the lip here. You don't need to hollow this way down. Leave extra material if in doubt. We only want to get this that it'll go over the engine. And the reason for that would be as many times you carve an opening somewhere and all of a sudden you realize, oh geez, it's just, you got to put the engine in and now it seems like, and this is just a good point, it seems like these blades have about the life expectancy of carving one top block, no matter what, how punky the wood is, they don't really last indefinitely. And like number 11s and 26s, you can re-sharpen up, up to a point, but these don't seem that way. So the, the thought is, if you're going to order a couple of packs of blades, buy extra ones if you're going to do car carving and hollowing to any degree. And see, I'm going to work my way right down into the nose ring and then pull the rest of this material out little by little. Small shavings are the answer. Okay, the rest I'm going to do with the Dremel tool the sanding drum. The best way I know of to do this with a sanding drum is to really use a low speed. Low speeds, add the variable speed. If you try to do it at a high speed, it really doesn't work as well. The whole trick here is Hold the part steady, take a little bit at a time. You can hold it up to the light and see when you're getting too thin. We certainly don't want to make this any thinner than it has to be to get the motor in there. When you get down to where it's, it's really getting down to the final little bit and it's thin, a good way to get the last little bit, I shut the vacuum bench off so you could hear what's happening here, is I'm just taking and putting little lines in. 
just little lines with the corner of the of the uh, drum. And what I do is I get all the lines in, just a little bit. Then I hold it up to the light and see where I'm getting too thin. Now the next time, let me suck some of this stuff down. The next time I go through this, and this, this is really a neat little trick. All I do, I, I know where I'm thin. I avoid that area. And I can just put the lines in this way. And this allows you to get it down really to where it's relatively thin without poking through 40 or 50 times. And still the best way then is to verify it using your fingers as calipers. Using your finger, oh, I see it's a little heavy up here. But using that back and forth technique, it really allows you to take a lot of material out in kind of a big hurry. Where if you did all the turning this way, you'd almost always find a spot that was too thin and then whoop, you got a problem. Especially if you were going to use this, actually use this piece for cowling, you'd like it to be relatively uh, equal, not thicker here, thinner, thicker, thinner. You'd like it to be all the same. So what I want to do, I want to hold this up to the side. I don't know if I can see this on the macro and see, roughly get a rough idea where our motor is going to be poking through here. Of course, this doesn't cover the whole motor. You just get a rough idea where this opening is going to be. Always make it a little bit smaller than it has to be in the beginning. Okay, then I can just rough this out and start fitting it little by little. Dry fit one, one time. I don't want to make this way too big, so let me get this cut out and come back and dry fit it. Usually it pokes through at the exhaust, the venturi, the tip of the head fins too. And of course a lot of this you have to do by eye. I know I'm going to come as far back as here. As far forward, probably going to have to go a little bit further forward for the venturi. And you can just interpolate this in. By the way, this cowling design shape, we've used it on Streg, on Tsunami. Many other people have used it. I don't, I, the list goes on and on. But it's so efficient, so easy to make. It, it's almost, you really have to find a reason not to use it. And all these big Bombay drop away cowlings, boy, oh boy. After doing a little test fit, I can see I'm a little bit short here and here. So it's 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 easier to make it a little too small to begin with than it is to make it too big, and then have to then to fill it in. Now see, even though this fits here, I can see when I have the Venturi in there, it's going to be a pain in the ass to choke it. So what I want to do, and I want to get all this stuff right, because once I make the mold, I don't want to have to go back and do this again. little bit I can dress off with that dowel with some sticky back paper. I want to line this edge with 64th plywood. See how the last little bit just dresses right off. So I want to leave at least a 64th around the motor, around the fins and everything. Some of these motors have different head shapes. The older motors have a little bit bigger fins so I want to be able to put obviously any motor that uh, in my well used collection here in here. And we hope Big Jim's going to be better real soon and back to working on motors. He's been a hurting puppy lately. Now 
And see what I like to have is at least a 64th clearance on each side. Because remember what we're going to do here. The problem is we're going to take this and line this whole edge with 64th plywood. And I also want to have the hot air rushing through here. There'll be a low pressure area inside the cowl here to pull that right through, right on through. Now one of the real handy things, a Super Tiger 60, when you're making this opening in the back, is to get it symmetrical and even. One of the things I've found works perfect, put some sticky back sandpaper on a kicker bottle, or on any jar that's pretty much that diameter, and it lets you get that curve in, because once I line this with the plywood, I can't change the curve easily. So I want to get this curve symmetrical and even, and of course I want the... Uh, the air to be forced around the fins and down into that low pressure area. And I really make sure I have the clearance here and that the hole is kind of symmetrical and that it'll be convenient to get down and choke the engine. Another thing too, whenever you choke an engine it's dripping, you don't have all that fuel working its way inside the cowling and it, with this kind of cowling it just drops right out. Very, very efficient. This is This is probably the best one I've ever uh, come across as far as being a realistic cowling. Again, the acid test. How did it hold up after a season of flying? Not a scratch, not a crack, not a wrinkle. This is the reason, you know, you do something one year and you just try to improve it a little bit the next year, but once you get a winning system, you don't want to change it. Whenever you do the lining with 64th ply, you'll notice one way you can bend it, the other way you'll hear all kind of things cracking and snapping. The grain is going on two sides, two or three plies it's going in one direction. So that's the direction I want to run that little lining inside the cowl. So what I want to do is here is just strip off a piece. Well, maybe an inch wide I guess will be enough. Nothing fancy. But the important thing is the grain goes this way. I can bend it this way. You see, I can bend this right into position. It almost holds, it almost stays there by itself. And I'm a little short, I'm going to have to splice a little piece in the back. Now what I do, I tack glue it down in the corners, and then I can raise or lower this, because I want to get a little radius up here. And then I can just run my bead of glue Once it's tacked in, and you can kind of just press that right in position. And work your way right around it. And I have to make a little piece up in the back, of course. Again, this gives us the edge that we're looking for. And we can just get the rest of this out of here just so we can block sand that edge later. Before you do any grinding, get it from the inside too. Get that in nice and solid before you do the block sanded edge. Okay, I always check, check all my fits that I'm not working myself into uh, getting, getting where I have no clearance here. Now, last thing is, I'm going to make a 64th plywood nose ring. And what that does, this is going to space this back up the cowl just a 64th of an inch. And what it'll give me is a little extra material in a mold to, to grind away and get that spinner fit just right. It's really just for, just for the final clearance. It leaves me a little extra material in the mold. Now what I can do with this, I'm not going to hollow the piece inside out. I can interpolate this. This will be, I got the grain going this way. This, this is going to plug this end of the mold up too when we make the, the final plug for the mold. Again, we don't have to worry about what the inside of this looks like right now. Now the last thing I have to do is with the grain cross grain, get some 64th plywood around the edge to seal this up. Now I'll cut this just a little bit oversize. 
and I'll be able to glue that right in position. And make sure I have it right on the line. Now we're getting near the end of this tape. I may not get this finished on this tape, but for sure we'll pick it up on the next one. Now notice I did this on a perfectly flat table because I want to have that a flat line. I want that I don't want that piece to have any ripples in it. Now I'll get the Dremel, get that edge real nice and smooth, and then contour everything right back to that. And that'll be, that'll be, I really just have to put the radius in here with Bondo. This will be ready for the plug. down the bottom here just to keep this strong on the edge just let this kick off naturally so this will make it a little bit stronger I pick one little spot at a time because I'm going to put Bondo on here just get a little bit on and just wipe it real quick with a paper towel before it kicks don't let the paper towel stick to it this hardens up the wood, and so when we get the Bondo fillet in there, we, can, we will not be grinding against soft wood. The whole idea of this is just to harden up the wood a little bit. It also makes the mold just a tiny bit oversized, and that's good too, because if anything, we can sand the mold down into the fuselage then. You don't want to have this really, you know, within a thickness of uh, a piece of bologna. I want to have a little bit of extra material here so I can contour that right in on a final fit. I just want to get this kind of smoothed out and I'll mix up the Bondo to make the fillet. Just get all the rough high spots off because we will final sand this. The idea is to leave this wood hard so I can get a good sanding edge on a radius. I don't want to go down through the CA. Okay, that's kind of sanded in a best about the way we want. I want to mix up the Bondo here and get that radius in, and that's probably going to be the end of the tape, and we'll pick up the mold-making part of this on the next tape. Now, this is ordinary Bondo, and we're going to use this from time to time. There's no special brand that seems to be any better than the other. This is, uh, I bought this in a marine store, and I got the information from Florida Glue, Pro Glue Products and Ed Gallagher. There's always some oily residue that seems to float to the top when used Bondo. So the first thing you want to do is stir it real well before. You don't want to make that top, scoop off the top, and then you'll have all that, I guess it's oil. It looks like oil, resin, whatever it is. You want to get it stirred up real well till it's a nice, firm consistency. The thing, too, the hardener you put in here, there's supposed to be a real specific amount. Well, in reality, polyester resin, of which this is part of the family, is very, very uh, tolerant of mo too much or not enough hardener. In this case, though, just get a, just a little bit, and I know just from doing this roughly how much it is. If you're in doubt, you can always mix a little test batch. You want to mix that up real good, though. That's one of the tricks. And we're going to use Bondo over and over again, so it might be that this would be a good time for you to run out and get a can and kind of get, get a little familiar with the material. It's real. For modeling purposes, it's one of those overlooked materials. This will kick off a lot quicker than epoxolite, and I'm sure it's lighter. We'll be able to work this within an hour. And Kajeski's coming over, so maybe we'll work on his model next while this is kicking off. We're in that part of the year where everybody's Everybody's looking to get their plane started. By the way, we got a whole bunch of Cardinal kits in here the other day. There's 25 of them, and the wood is outstanding. All laser cut. If you're looking for one, give me a call. We'll put one together for you. 
Now, I wish I could say I found a better way to do this, but I haven't. Just using my finger for a little spatula here. Get used to it. Actually, this stuff does not sand very bad at all. And you'll feel on your finger when it starts getting warm, it'll kick. I remember the other, when I had the old camera, I had a bunch of this on my finger. And I went to shut the camera off and hit the button with Bondo. And it took me about a half an hour to clean the button off. This is where I want to blend that little radius in. Now see, one of the advantages of Bondo, that Bondo has, as opposed to Spackle, Bondo does have a little bit of strength. If you were to do this with Spackle, zero strength, none. And because this sand's so easy, you really don't have to make yourself crazy trying to get it all even and everything. Now, as this Bondo starts to kick off, it goes into what's called a cheese state, where it turns to like, well, well like provolone cheese. Now, see, I can't, I can't put a scratch in it anymore. I don't need to get it real smooth. A lot of people fool around trying to make it super smooth. It's really an unnecessary thing. If you go to sand this in 15 minutes, you can sand it. You probably could sand it right now. If you let it sit an hour or so, it's a lot easier to sand. So what I'm going to do is just put this aside. I'm just using a spatula to clean up the edges. And then I'll give this a good sanding. Okay, I hope you uh, enjoyed and got some benefit from this video. We're going to pick up making that cowling mold. Just a couple final thoughts. Thanks to Sam and all the people that contribute back into this. And, and obviously thanks for Midgley for passing a lot of this information and video and whatever on up his way. Seems like we've got an awful lot of people willing to share their information now. And if I've had some small part to play in that, great. If I haven't, well, you know the routine. Anyway, just getting a little mind's eye here. This will sit. We're going to work on Kajeski's plane this afternoon. And then I'll come back to this after we get his plane painted. Now what's nice is I got the other, the other piece in the mold. I can let that sit another day. I'll have another bottom block. I can put the cover on this. This stuff stinks. And you always can leave this out until you're done. So you, this tells you exactly when you're in full hardness. So if you want to try to sand, sand this. But it does go into that cheese state for a little bit of maybe 15 minutes. And then it'll just and be nice and hard, you can sand it. As soon as you can sand it and make dust, then you know it's fully hardened.